Okay, I think uh, we'll get started here. Um, first of all, I'd like to just introduce uh, introduce who will be speaking to you today. Uh, my name's Anna Martini. I'm here in the geology department. I'm a hydrogeochemist, um, which means I'm one of those rare geology people who don't actually look at rocks, or at least try not to. And my colleague here, Karina McKinney, is in the chemistry department here at Amherst, and she is an atmospheric chemist. And together, about five years ago, we started working on um, looking at mercury in the environment here in our uh, lovely valley. And it's a good place to look at mercury because we happen to be fortunate to have a very nice point source, a coal-fired power plant called the Mount Tom Power Plant, um, which has been delivering mercury into our environment for quite some time now. And so we've looked at it from uh, many different angles, and we've used a lot of undergraduate researchers over the summer to investigate both uh, atmospheric concentrations today, looking at deposition, and also looking more in the geologic past, looking at the record of deposition in and around here. So what we're basically, basically going to be doing today is um, we're going to kind of take a little meander, and we're going to look at, well, I should start off by saying what our title is, which you can see behind me. Um, very early on, they wanted a title for us for this uh, lecture because they wanted to send it out in a brochure to all of you guys. And we spent quality time trying to cover, come up with a title that would be broad enough and that I think is actually perfect for this political season because you can basically uh, do a lot with it. An environmental conundrum, the global and local implications of fossil fuel emissions, which means to say we're going to be taking you from looking at um, uh, global impacts of carbon dioxide in the environment and global warming specifically. And we're also going to be taking a little look at, once again, because this is a political year, we're going to take a little look at what our politicians have been telling us about not only tackling uh, sort of the two-headed, I can't think of the two-headed beast I thought of just a little while ago, but the two-headed problem or the uh, double-sided problem of both global warming on the one hand and dealing with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other emissions, and also uh, pollution effects, um, the other side of the story. It's not just all carbon dioxide. It is the other things that come from our use of fossil fuel. And if you've been listening to everyone talk in, the, in coming up to the election, you've heard a lot about um, uh, uh, basically breaking our hold on uh, global uh, fossil fuel resources basically becoming energy independent. You've heard that over and over again. We're going to try to become energy independent. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too. And that for the United States to become energy independent, we're basically uh, going to be right back at the Mount Tom power plant because we're going to end up having to talk a lot about coal. So I said there was two problems here. One of those problems is indeed global warming. And if through all of the other headlines that have caught your attention over the past uh, few months, um, if you've managed to read deep enough into your papers, into the science sections, what you've probably seen coming out of this last summer's uh, research up in the Arctic is that everything that has been predicted for the last 20, 30 years is not only occurring, not only do we see it occurring, but it seems to be speeding up. And what do I mean by that? Well, these images here, uh, sorry, we have to keep the lights up for the cameras. Um, but what you're looking at here is, is temperature going for back from, sorry, 18, uh, mid-1850s, start of industrialization, up to 2005. Uh, once again, if we had the last couple years data on it, it's accelerating. This is a rather uh, ominous um, figure up here. It's looking at North Atlantic sea ice. North Atlantic sea ice has been uh, going away uh, uh, been lowering year to year, and now this last summer we've had a tremendous, a tremendous amount of melt up there. Uh, you've probably heard about the plight of polar bears. Uh, it's, it's probably the most photogenic uh, uh, member of the polar community that's being affected. But it's affecting fishing villages, it's affecting uh, uh, shorelines, it's affecting, well, the one good thing is we might finally have a northwest passage to India. So think of the, think of the upside here. But it looks like we're going to have a world that is clear of North Atlantic sea ice um, uh, in the not-too-distant future. 
Down here, you're just looking at data of sea level rise, another aspect of global warming. And then finally over here, one of the things that's been sort of a hot topic of debate ever since Katrina, really, uh, has been has uh, sea surface temperatures led to an increase in the, either the number of storms or the, um, the frequency of storms, or at least have they made those storms more and more powerful. So all of these things have been showing uh, showing up, and all of these things are due to uh, due to greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. If we're looking specifically at CO2, which makes up the bulk of the greenhouse gas emissions that we talk about, you can see the steady rise through industrialization and into what this uh, graph ends at 2005. So there's been this huge rise in the amount of CO2 being emitted uh, globally. And that is just becoming faster and faster now that the rest of what was the previously known as the developing countries, as they develop, they are putting more and more CO2 into the atmosphere at an ever greater rates. Where does all that CO2 come from? Well, what we're really going to focus on today is this sort of large wedge here from coal. Um, you know, globally, petroleum products, all of our uh, transportation, oil, heating, etc., puts up a tremendous amount of CO2 also. But coal is significant for two things. I told you about energy independence. If the United States wants to become energy independent, we are the fret of really good petroleum resources. Don't listen to what they say about drilling in the north uh, on the Arctic Slope. It's fine. There are some very nice resources there. But in a world context, it's fairly pitiful for our demand. And so if we want to increase our energy independence, that's the section that's going to be going up. And if you look here at, at carbon dioxide emissions by sector, sector meaning residential, commercial, industrial, transportation, but I really only want you to focus on the bar here that um, similarly colored but that shows petroleum, natural gas, and coal. That is our uh, panoply of, of fossil fuel sources. And if you look at them in terms of CO2, there's the coal bar appropriately in black. The coal bar still going to play a significant role. And this is estimated out, US estimate out all the way to uh, 2030. So what is that going to do uh, in the environment and to atmospheric CO2 trends? Now, I'm going to segue over to Katrina, now, or, sorry, uh, to talk about uh, carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere and how it cycles throughout the biogeosphere. Thank you. Yes, so um, as a result of fossil fuel burning, we're emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. And one of the questions that we then need to answer is what happens to that CO2? Now, um, Fortunately for us, back in the late 1950s, um, a scientist by the name of Charles Keeling had the foresight to start measuring CO2 in the atmosphere. And what you see here is actually um, a record of that measurement going back to the late 1950s. And it's been continuous since then. These observations are recorded um, at a location called Mauna Loa uh, Observatory, which is in Hawaii. And here's a picture of it right here. Um, and Basically, CO2 has been de being measured at this station daily uh, for over 50 years now. And this is what that time sequence of CO2 in the atmosphere looks like. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, there are two distinct things that you can see in this, um, in this record. One of them is the increasing trend of CO2 with time. But the other is that you see this little sawtooth pattern. And the reason that this is important is because if we want to understand how CO2 builds up in the atmosphere over time, we have to understand what other processes affect atmospheric CO2. And atmospheric CO2 is affected not only by fossil fuel emissions, but also by natural processes. So um, because this is a class and we want to have uh, lots of audience participation here, I'm going to ask, does anybody know um, or does anybody have uh, any ideas about what natural processes affect atmospheric CO2? Yes. Okay, so photosynthesis from plants. So plants use CO2 in the process of photosynthesis 
to actually create organic carbon. So they convert the carbon from CO2 to organic matter, and that's what plants use to grow. Um, does anybody have another idea There's of another major process? I, well, I think it's, it's methane, uh, cows um, dung. Yes, that's, actually, that's right. Um, so cows are a major source of, of methane um, to the atmosphere. And because we are now growing more and more cows for meat production and milk, uh, that source is certainly increasing. Um, but focusing a little bit more on CO2, other places that CO2 goes. Yes. Uh, is it absorbed in the ocean through, through the plankton? Exactly right. OK, so not only through plankton, um, which do photosynthesis in the ocean, but also the ocean itself takes up CO2 because CO2 is soluble in water. Okay, so, um, and we know that actually because we have things like carbonated beverages. So carbonated beverages, um, when you get a bottle of Coke and the bottle is closed, that CO2 is actually dissolved in the liquid and you open the bottle up and relieve, release the pressure a little bit and that CO2 starts to um, bubble out of solution, but that's a demonstration of the fact that CO2 is soluble in water. So these are the two major processes, major natural processes, by which CO2 is exchanged between the atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. Um, so land plants do photosynthesis, in which they take up CO2, convert it to organic matter, and they also do respiration, where they, the, they um, Organic matter is combined with, C with O2 from the atmosphere to re-release CO2 um, gas back to the atmosphere. Um, and we also have dissolution in the oceans, um, CO2 gas combining with water, which then dissociates um, to make uh, bicarbonate ion and H+. And this process is also reversible. Okay, so both of these um, are processes by which you have exchange of CO2 between the atmosphere and the surface. Um, so going back to the last graph for a minute, one of these processes is responsible for the sawtooth that we actually see in uh, this graph. Which of these processes do you think that is? Do you think it's photosynthesis or do you think it's ocean uptake? Um, there's a temperature component to it, definitely. Okay, so it's true. There's, there's more land mass in one hemisphere than the other. Um, this is actually in the northern hemisphere, um, Hawaii is. So we're looking more at the northern hemisphere cycle here. Um, what else do you think is true about photosynthesis? Is it the same the whole year round? Probably not. It's going to take place more in the you know, spring and the summer, less in the fall and the winter when mm -hmm. you know, leaves aren't around. No plants are buried under snow. Okay, so that's exactly right. So most of the photosynthesis takes place during the growing season, which is in the spring and summer. And during that time of the year, this, the CO2 actually decreases as it's being taken up by plants. And that rate is faster than the rate of respiration or the rate of emission of CO2 um, from other sources. But then during the winter and fall, um, when photosynthesis basically slows down, then the rate of respiration is faster than the rate of photosynthesis. And so we have um, the reverse pattern where the CO2 level in the atmosphere increases again. <clears throat> yes, question? Based on the seasonal variation in that, one would think that the effect in like spring and summer and then fall and winter is enough that the pace of human production isn't enough to slow that down. Because you're still getting even as much as CO2 we're putting in you still see seasonal decreases and increases. Um, that's true. But what you can think about here is that those seasonal increases and decreases are being in, superimposed on the larger trend. So you can still see the trend here. Sure. Um, and this, the trend is due to fossil fuel emissions. So that is due to a larger, uh, uh, an increase in the rate at which we're adding fossil fuel CO2 to the atmosphere. Okay. Um, that is not balanced by a net rate of uptake, okay? So that's why the atmospheric CO2 increases um, over time. And you definitely still can see this seasonal cycle superimposed on that. But basically, this is evidence for the fact that natural cycles modify 
um, the CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. And in fact, <coughs> um, so this is a bigger scale picture of that larger cycle of CO2 being exchanged between the atmosphere and various reservoirs, vegetation on land and the ocean. And in fact, if we look at um, the amount of CO2 that we've been adding to the atmosphere over time, that's the black line here, okay? And this is a rate, so this is petagrams um, a petagram is 10 to the 15 grams, okay? So 10 to the 15 grams of carbon per year. And we're adding, um, starting in the 1960s on this graph, we were adding about two and a little bit petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere per year in the, terms, in the form of fossil fuel emissions. And that has now increased to a rate of about six petagrams per year today, okay? Now, if all of the CO2 being emitted from fossil fuels were staying in the atmosphere, then we would expect the atmospheric increase to be equal to that rate of fossil fuel emissions. But actually, if we, if we measure the rate of atmospheric increase of CO2, we get this red line here. Okay? So you can see that um, the atmospheric CO2 is in fact increasing because this number is always positive, but it's increasing by less than the total fossil fuel emissions, okay? And the implication of that is that some of the CO2 that we're adding to the atmosphere is actually being taken up by these other reservoirs in the form of net growth of land plants and net uptake of CO2 into the ocean. And this is actually um, a fortunate thing because if these processes weren't occurring, then the rate of increase of CO2 in the atmosphere would actually be greater than it currently is today. Okay. But the other important thing is that in order to project what atmospheric CO2 will be in the future, we need to understand these processes and we need to be able to project how effective these processes will be going into the future. Now that's actually a fairly difficult thing to do because these are natural processes, natural systems, um, and they can be quite variable. And in fact, what you see in this graph is that there's year-to-year -year variability in the amount of CO2 that's being taken up by both the oceans and the biosphere, by plants and, and things like that, okay? And we're, no, we're by no means assured that these rates will continue to be the same in the future. <clears throat> um, was there a question? I saw it. Yes. Isn't it changing the pH factor in the ocean also? It is, yes. So dissolution of CO2 in the ocean actually acidifies the ocean. Um, to and there are implications to that. There are, yes, for future CO2 uptake as well, because as you acidify it, it becomes less soluble. What about deforestation on this, like Brazil cutting uh, down uh, forests? Yeah. Excellent question. So deforestation represents a net decrease in carbon stored in land plants, which would in turn um, contribute to an increase in atmospheric CO2. So in order for um, the biosphere, which we can think of as the sum total of organic carbon in plants, um, in order for that to be a net sink of atmospheric carbon, the total mass of the biosphere must increase with time. So uh, uh, deforestation actually decreases the amount of carbon stored in land plants. Now, currently, um, worldwide, we have a net positive rate of reforestation, if you will. So um, right now, the amount of car carbon uh, stored in land plants is actually increasing. Um, on balance, some of that, so it is decreasing to a certain extent, say in the tropics and the Amazon, but it's actually increasing at further northern latitudes. Like in the US, we're actually reforesting. So it's a balance between those terms that determines the net carbon storage. Okay, so another thing that we need to take into account then, besides just emissions of carbon, is also um, the natural cycles that interact with these gases once they're in the atmosphere. And that allows us then to come up with um, projections of what 
CO2 in the atmosphere will look like in the future. So this is a record of uh, CO2, atmospheric CO2, um, as a function of time going back pretty far in time, hundreds of thousands of years. And you can see that CO2 varied in this band. Um, and that now today, uh, due to uh, anthropogenic activities, we're now increasing CO2 by quite a bit above that. And if we project that into the future, these are different scenarios that we can come up with based on different um, rates of fossil fuel use there, where we can project what future atmospheric CO2 will look like. Okay, um, And we're currently at about 380 parts per um, million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is projecting to 2100, where we'll have somewhere between 500 and 900 um, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, depending on which uh, scenario or what, um, what policies we use in terms of fossil fuel use. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Martini. Who's I'd just like to say one thing about this slide. I, I show this in my Geo9 class, that little green line there. I call that the dream on. Uh, <laughs> because I don't think we're ever going to institute policies that will cut our CO2 to this modeled line. We're going to be more up in this range. So making the segue back to uh, one of the largest producers of CO2, that is coal again, uh, once again, uh, you've heard from both of our candidates. You've heard them talk about clean coal technologies. Uh, you've heard it from our president over the past uh, seven years. He's been talking about clean coal technologies. So is it political rhetoric or is it reality? And the answer, of course, like most things, is somewhere in that gray area in between. Um, these are just some pretty pictures of, well, pretty pictures if you're a geologist, maybe. This is how you look at a wall of coal that spans you know, uh, 10 million years of geologic time. Uh, you get a lot of good samples this way. Why did I say that we were going to have to focus on coal again to um, uh, do something about our energy independence? Well, it's very obvious. If you look at the lower 48, and I could have put Alaska up here too, because Alaska has some huge coal deposits. We're just uh, rich in coal. We're very rich in coal. The other country in the world that is as rich in coal as we are happens to be China. So the fastest developing economy in the world happens to have a ton of coal. And we happen to have um, ample coal supplies, where we don't have the same amount of oil or gas. But coal is not the best thing in the world to burn for many reasons. Um, this is a picture. I love this picture. You can't see it very well. Once again, it's so dark. But can you see that that's a double-decker bus? And those are the headlights there. This is a picture taken at high noon in Piccadilly Circus in London in 1952, during December, when they were having a bit of a smog issue. Now, that bit of a smog issue um, led to, you know, I joke about it, but led to um, a few thousand deaths. Uh, the hospitals in London were filled. They were transporting children out of the city into the countryside. Uh, it happened because of a, a, a weather condition that basically kept uh, it was stale and stagnant. There was no wind at all, and it was brutally cold that winter in December. And all residences in London in 1952 heated their homes with coal. So they had little coal fires in their homes. And this led to some of the first most uh, 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 widely expansive legislation on regulating coal. And it worked by the very next year. Those residences, they just ripped out the coal furnaces and they started to uh, uh, put natural gas in, uh, build central, uh, 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 central energy plants, and they really got rid of this problem in a very short period of time. I mean, they still have their smog, but they got rid of this sort of, I think it led to about 3,000 deaths during this, this week in December um, this time. Now, what were they caused by? What was, what was so bad besides it just being dark, pitch black at noon um, uh, 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 in there? Well, the pitch black is this one down here, the particulate matter. So you had lots of little particles that were just not completely burned in their stoves. 
clogging up the air. So that was uh, part of the problem. But the other problem is coal just happens to be rich with what is important elements for us, for, for all life. It happens to be rich in nitrogen. It happens to be rich in sulfur. And when you burn that and you put it up into the atmosphere, what you make is various nitrous oxides, various sulfur oxides. Those love to form acid. So the smog that the people were breathing in in London had about a pH of 2. Think vinegar. So they were breathing in about a pH, an acidity of 2, because of sulfuric acid and nitric acid. So that's bad enough. But then if you go down the list here, we've already talked about CO2. If you go down the list here, coal happens to be just enriched, enriched in metals. And one of those metals that happens to have a lot of detrimental effects, of course, is mercury. But you could say the same about lead and arsenic in coals. Now, why is that? I mean, if you think of it, I have the picture up here. I should have just pointed it out. A beautiful environment here that makes a lovely coal bed in the future. It looks just very nice and healthy. Why does it get all that stuff in it? Well, one process is it's simply all that organic matter, the lovely forest, whether it's a uh, temperate rainforest that might make a good coal bed someday, or it's a swampy marsh area like the Everglades. It gets buried, it becomes peat, and then as it gets buried further and further and further, it gets more compacted, uh, higher pressures, higher temperatures, you finally end up with a good coal bed sometime in the geologic future. Okay? But coal is just like that activated carbon that you use in your Brita water filters. You know why you use it in your Brita water filters? You use it because carbon does a great job of sucking up metals. So you put the water in, your lead, your mercury leaves the water, goes into that activated carbon, you throw out the filter. Well, you know, the environment has a lot of these metals in it. And you concentrate them over time, and you put them in organic matter, and it just gets richer and richer. So how about the good news and bad news here? Well, we have regulated emissions from coal-fired power plants um, starting in the 70s. The Clean Air Act was a very, very good thing. If you look at, um, at concentrations both of the nitrous oxide and the sulfur oxide species, those which uh, came to uh, the front page when we're talking about acid rain, et cetera, we've increased our use of coal 70% from this takes you from 1980 to 2001, but we have managed to drop down the total amount of nitrogen oxides by about 58%, the total amount of sulfur oxides by 62%. The pH of our rain is actually going up again from the lows of like a pH of 4 that it had hit. So acid rain is one problem of burning a lot of coal that we're beginning to get a handle on. And there's some fairly simple techniques. I mean, they fought, the power companies fought it tooth and nail, the Clean Air Act, and they're still fighting it today because it hasn't all been impl uh, implemented yet. But they're fairly simple techniques of washing the smoke as it comes out of the smokestack, basically spraying water in there to collect what's going to collect in your acid rain anyway and dropping it down. And there are chemical techniques that we have uh, to absorb in um, and take down a lot of the sulfur. We have electric static, you put guys probably in your homes, you have electrostatic air filtration systems. We put those in the coal stacks to get rid of the particulate matter. So we have much less particulate matter being uh, uh, going. Yep. The, uh, the chart, you, the coal use is going up 70%. The coal NOx is going down 58% per unit, but not in total. Uh, it's pounds per megawatt it's hour. It's pounds per megawatt hour. It's also, you know, you know, I was saying the pH of the rain is going down. That's a very good point. We built a lot more power plants out west. And so the pH of the rain in the east in Massachusetts has actually been rising up because we put more and more of these uh, uh, technologies have been put into power plants that are actually uh, in, um, in our area. Uh, and larger power plants that are being built today. It doesn't have an efficiency term in it, though, does it? Well, the efficiency, the, the efficiency of all of these plants have, has been going up significantly also. So that is not on this, this graph, but the efficiency of them have been going up. Because that's included and it's implied by the milliwatt hour yep. versus the millions of short tons is just how much coal's getting burned, right? 
So there's another term missing that probably accounts for your point that overall we're clean. We got to be cleaner. We, we, I guarantee you, we are we are much cleaner. Yeah. So even if we're using as much coal, we're getting a lot more energy out of it. Yeah. And that's one way that one way that you clean up a coal-fired power plant is simply to make it more efficient at burning coal. So you use less energy and, and you, you send more energy out to the grid, I should say, and you lose less energy in the plant itself. Oh, wait. I forgot my last little statement there. Emissions down, but where does it all go? One of the points I want to make here is that we're taking the sulfur, taking the nitrogen out, taking a lot of the mercury out, uh, doing a lot to clean up that, but where does it all go? It's not like it disappears. It's not like, it, it's not like you lose it. You have it at the power plant. It's just not going up into the atmosphere. So we are just changing waste streams, and that is an important point. So we are changing the waste stream from a stream that goes into the atmosphere and affects us perhaps globally with some contaminants, and making that waste a uh, solid waste that we're going to put into a landfill that may affect very local things that I study, like aquifers, your drinking water, that may affect those areas significantly. So the waste doesn't go away. It just changes the stream that it's in. OK, so when these people talk about clean coal, true clean coal, what, do they, what are they mentioning? Well, what they're talking about is an idea an idea that you could actually burn coal and have no net emissions at all. You still have that other waste stream, but no net emissions. To have no net emissions, you use all those technologies I've talked about to get rid of the sulfur, the nitrogen, particulate matter, mercury, other metals, but you've got to do something with the CO2 also for it to be truly clean coal. And what they talk about doing with it is, of course, sequestration. You've heard a lot about it. If you could just capture all that CO2 that you use by, by burning fossil fuels and send it underground somewhere, send it away somewhere for geologic periods of time, then you would truly have uh, a clean uh, fossil fuel resource. And there's lots of places where you could send the CO2. They talk about sending it down deep in the ocean, uh, deep water circulations around 4,000 years, so we wouldn't have to worry about it for a while. Um, I don't know what it would do to the biota down there. There would be some big uh, talking about acidification of the oceans. That would acidify the oceans pretty nice. So maybe coral reefs eventually would not be that happy. Um, but you could send it down into old mines. You could actually send it back into coal mines because coal actually absorbs quite a bit of carbon dioxide uh, itself. So you can send it down um, and sequester it away. And the big plant, the big um, news item from, I think, Bush's State of the Union address in, I think it was 2003, where he talked about they were going to fund this future gen project. So the future gen, this is a schematic painting of it. It looks like it's real and built, but it's just a schematic drawing of what it's going to look like. So this is going to be a coal power plant that's going to take the coal, it's going to gasify it. So you use quite a bit of energy to actually extract gas from coal, but you can do it. There's no reason you can't take long chain hydrocarbons and break them up into short chain. So you get natural gas out of it. You can actually get hydrogen. You can break out hydrogen from it. And they're going to, of course, clean up anything that comes out of the flue, capture the carbon, and sequester it down below in an uh, abandoned um, uh, oil field. Have you heard anything about uh, using algae to sequester CO2? There's a nice, there's a little power plant uh, a small power plant in New Mexico now where they have a, um, it's a coal-fired power plant where the CO2 is literally bubbling through little bags in the desert of algae. So you have all of these little bags of green algae growing off of the CO2 from, and it, it's a beautiful idea. Um, there's a couple problems with it. Uh, one is that it's expensive. You need a lot of bags of algae growing and the amount of CO2 coming out, this is a small power plant they're doing it with, there's a lot of CO2. I mean, you know, these would be like force feeding, like faux gras. Uh, uh, you know, it'd be kind of hard to do on a big scale. The other thing is, unfortunately, uh, you've got to really then clean up the waste stream. Because if you want to use that algae for anything else, like, oh, it would be a great food source, right? Uh, yeah, it absorbs quite a bit of mercury, too. <laughs> 
you could then turn that algae then into liquid petroleum products and you know run on biodiesel. So so yes. But the problem with all of these things, well, let me just finish off with this future gin plant. It was a great idea. Uh, cost overruns, you know, not everyone's ever heard of cost overruns before. Uh, it was supposed to be a 15, was it 15 million dollar uh, tiny little plant. It ended up probably costing around 60 million dollars for this very small pilot project. And DOE, which was going to half fund it, they pulled out last January. So now they don't even know if this is going to be built. So when I say this, how far off? True clean coal technologies, not just the ones we're using now to take, get rid of acid rain and to try to control uh, mercury coming out of the flue, but to sequester CO2 is a long ways off. And at the best forecast, they're saying 10, 20 years off. So what we're left with in terms of the United States and in terms of energy independence and in terms of our growing electrical needs, which are tremendously growing. If we turn over our auto industry into electric cars, I mean, just imagine how much more electricity we're going to have to generate in a very short period of time. We're not going to have this, and we're going to have to deal with the other part of it, energy independence, global warming. Is that to say that uh, driving electric cars as opposed to um, the, the most cars we have today, that switching over to electric wouldn't actually have a very good impact on carbon emissions overall? Oh, it completely depends. I, I would, I would, t I would say that it, it, it depends on what our, um, do we have? I should have, shouldn't have banged on the microphone. <laughs> do we have the heart to say that? Look, we're just going to have to build another 100, 200. Nuclear power, nuclear power plants. Are we going to do that? I mean, do we, do we, is that going to happen in the United States? So we can make electricity cleanly. Of course, that's, that's like an oxymoron there too, perhaps. Um, but the one, the resource that we have, that we have the technology for, and that we're more, it's more acceptable to us still at this stage is burning coal. Are there, can you talk about environmental impact to increase? Mining for coal and also safety for the workers. Oh, wow! Where do I start? You know, I, I had a picture in one of my lectures. I have a picture of like a black lung disease of a coal mine worker after you know 20 years down in the coal mine. It's one of the one of the uh, 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 has one of the highest death rates um, uh, among workers. There's the stripping of the land. There's acid mine runoff uh, into aquifers from wherever they coal mine. So it, it, it's really it, it's so, a. So how do you balance it out? <laughs> you know, we need the energy. And, you know, I, I asked me about the, like, the T. Boone Pickens plan, because I've been doing some research on that one, too. Like, set up these wind farms all the way from North Dakota down to Texas and uh, run all of our vehicles off uh, compressed natural gas. Not a bad idea in the short term. Um, but electricity, it, it's, electricity flows like water, but it also evaporates like water. And so electricity, if you make it in North Dakota, you make it in Texas, it's really hard to help out the East Coast. It's really hard to transport efficiently electricity those distances, which is why we have our coal-fired power plants you know, located nearby. And that gets me to the next part of this. Um, we're we're going to look at one of those other insidious uh, uh, byproducts of not only cold, coal, but of the industrial age uh, in general and um, dominantly uh, human-caused emissions. So this is just a little pie chart showing human-caused mercury emissions, direct meaning coal-fired power plants in general, human-caused emissions re-emitted. That's like municipal waste, hospital waste. I have another uh, slide to show the breakdown. And then natural emissions, well, quite a bit gets emitted from volcanoes. That's a perfectly natural, reasonable uh, uh, way for mercury to get into the environment. Also, a lot gets emitted from oceans. And that may or may not be partly humanly impacted because we've been using mercury for quite some time. In fact, the Romans loved mercury. Mercury has been, been around for a long time. Mercury has some very serious health effects. I don't, I'm not going to read this list to you. But probably the one that we worry about the most is the health effects on, on the brain, and especially with young children and developing uh, fetuses. 
is my alma mater state. This is why I've got my, my mercury emission slide from Michigan. Go Wolverines. Um, Coal-fired power plants, huge amount of the mercury going up into the atmosphere uh, in Michigan. And this is pretty similar for all other, other, most other eastern states. 7% um, here is industrial coal. Um, the other big ones are municipal waste. We've been talking a lot about how do you get more energy. Well, burn the municipal waste and generate electricity that way. Unfortunately, our waste stream is not clean at all. So when we burn that municipal waste, we put a lot of other toxins up into the atmosphere. Okay. And finally here, a global distribution of mercury sources. The reds are the hot spots. Of course, our northeast, maybe that red spot is Mount Tom. I don't know. Uh, mining, we happen to have most of our mercury mines are all in California. It's not like they have so many coal-fired plants, but lots of mercury mining there, also in South Africa. And the other real super hot spot you see here, it's that developing, developing country there. They are burning a ton of coal, and that's what's going to keep our CO2 emissions going sky high worldwide, and it's going to keep our mercury emissions going sky high. And mercury even more so, I would say, than CO2, has a complex and varied uh, chemistry as it moves around the various uh, atmosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere. And that I'm going to toss off again to talk about the cycling of mercury in the environment. OK. So again, just like we talked about when we were talking about CO2, in order to understand, excuse me, in order to understand how mercury impacts the environment, we have to understand the processes that control its behavior once it's actually emitted from uh, the power plant uh, and other sources. So this uh, schematic diagram shows some of those processes. So we have burning of fossil fuel and coal plants um, emitting mercury, but also um, things like, uh, as we said, volcanoes, um, mining, <clears throat> uh, volatilization from uh, rocks and minerals, so that's another natural source, uh, crop burning because plants contain a fair amount of mercury, um, and evaporation from the ocean. Okay, so those are ways that, that mercury gets into the atmosphere. What happens to it once it gets into the atmosphere? Um, another thing about the atmosphere, by the way, so the, one of the things the atmosphere can do is actually transport things, chemicals, fairly long distances in fairly short periods of time because transport in the atmosphere is fast. So once it gets into the atmosphere, um, it can be transported either over short distances or long distances. A lot of that depends on um, the chemical itself and its chemical properties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but basically, once you get mercury into the atmosphere, the way that you get it out again um, is through deposition, either through precipitation. So if you have water-soluble forms of mercury, then when it rains, those water-soluble forms can be deposited to the surface. Or um, the other way that um, isn't explicitly shown on here, but the other way that you can deposit mercury to the surface is actually referred to as dry deposition. And that is um, just uh, basically deposition through contact with the surface Okay, so something contacts the surface and it doesn't leave again. Um, or through sedimentation or settling out of particles like dust and so on and so forth that actually contains mercury. Okay, so that, those two things combined represent dry deposition. Um, and again, the chemical, um, the chemical makeup, the chemical properties of the substance determine its rates of wet and dry deposition. Once it's deposited back to the surface, it can get into things like waterways. It can be um, transported through waterways to um, larger um, systems. Um, one of the things that happens there once you get it into lakes and rivers and so on is that um, mercury bioaccumulates. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so that even if you have relatively low concentrations of mercury in, say, the water, you have much higher concentrations uh, in fish and larger animals. <clears throat> and it's actually through um, consumption of fish that most of the mercury is then transmitted to people. So we want to understand um, the, the global distribution of mercury deposition so that we can think a little bit about 
um, what areas will be most affected by these processes. Okay. Um, so the cycle has these different steps where first it goes into the atmosphere, um, it moves through the atmosphere, it's then deposited, um, eventually converted into um, the more toxic forms such as methylmercury. So in the atmosphere, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, mercury is mostly in elemental form, that is just mercury metal, but as a vapor. Um, as probably all of you know, mercury, if you just have it at room temperature, is primarily a liquid. It's one of the very few metals that's a liquid at room temperature. But it's actually um, sufficiently volatile that even if you have, say, a beaker of mercury, which we no longer do. Um, <laughs> some of you may remember a time when in chemistry class you'd actually play around with a beaker of mercury, but we don't do that anymore. Um, so if you have liquid mercury open to the atmosphere, it's actually volatile enough that it will evaporate and go into the gas phase and then be transmitted. So you have significant amount of um, elemental mercury in the gas phase. Um, then you can also have ionic forms of mercury. Um, and eventually, those ionic forms of mercury can be converted in biological systems to methylmercury and other organic mercuries. And those are the ones that are highly toxic. Okay. Yeah. So is mercury a greenhouse gas at all, or is it more a risk to the ecosystem and to, to human health? Yes. Yeah. Mercury is not a greenhouse gas. Um, it's also present in very, very, very small concentrations in the atmosphere. So even with all this emissions that we're talking about, the concentrations of gas phase mercury in the atmosphere are on the order of parts per quadrillion. That's, one, that's about 10 parts, say, in 10 to the 15 molecules. So it's very low concentrations in the gas phase. So because of that, it can't be of an effective um, greenhouse gas. Also, um, mercury, even if it, there was a lot of it, wouldn't be a greenhouse gas um, just because of its chemical properties. Um, so we're not really worried about it in that respect. It's, it's toxic effects that we're worried about. Okay, so mercury in the atmosphere um, exists in three forms. One is the elemental gaseous mercury that I was talking about a minute ago. This turns out to be fairly unreactive, which is actually why if you ever played with a beaker full of mercury, um, it didn't kill you on the spot uh, <laughs> because it's actually pretty unreactive. Um, what's more reactive is the ionic forms of mercury. So reactive gas, gaseous mercury, which is mainly mercury in the plus two oxidation state. Um, much more reactive, much more soluble, okay? And also, um, uh, one of the forms that is primarily converted uh, or more quickly converted into um, the toxic forms like methylmercury. And then finally, particulate mercury. Um, so this would be mercury in particles. So for example, the fly ash that's emitted from coal-fired power plants contains a fairly large amount of mercury. Um, that mercury, because it's in particulate form, has a different fate in the atmosphere than the, than the gaseous forms. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, gaseous mercury, so this is the elemental mercury, is chemically stable and has an, a lifetime in the atmosphere of about a half to two years. And that's actually a fairly long period of time for something to stay in the atmosphere. And because of that, elemental mercury can be transported very long distances. So in, in fact, um, elemental mercury emitted from power plants in China is of concern to us in the United States because it stays in the atmosphere long enough that it can actually be transported here. <coughs> um, <coughs> the other forms of mercury, um, reactive gaseous mercury and particulate mercury, have much shorter atmospheric lifetimes on the order of days to weeks. And so those forms of mercury are actually only transported fairly short distances. So you can see here that um, the transport distances of the different forms. So um, elemental mercury can be transported globally, but the other two forms of mercury, reactive mercury and particulate mercury, are deposited within fairly short distances from their source. Okay. So these are the ones that we're worried about in terms of local effects um, of mercury. Um, okay, 
Now, once it's deposited to the surface, um, I said that it gets into food webs. How did that happen? Well, so it can be directly deposited from the atmosphere to these lakes or rivers, or it can flow in um, through uh, subsurface flow and streams into lakes and rivers. Once it's there, mercury undergoes this phenomenon called bioaccumulation. And this, as I said, leads to much higher concentrations in higher organisms than in the atmosphere or in the water itself. So um, <clears throat> what happens gradually is that that mercury is converted from these other forms that I was talking about into methylmercury. So this um, shows you as a function of stage on the food chain what percentage of the mercury is actually in the form of methylmercury. So it's actually converted in biological systems to methylmercury. So the, the, the percentage of methylmercury increases as you move up the food chain. And the other thing is that um, as organisms, organisms take in mercury, but they're not very good at um, letting it out again. So they store it. Fairly small, simple organisms have about the same mercury concentration as the background, say as the water that they're in. But as more and more organisms eat those simpler organisms, they tend to concentrate the mercury in, contained in those simpler organisms. So that by the time you get to um, the top of the food chain, which in this case is birds, say, in, in um, an aquatic ecosystem, you've concentrated the mercury by a factor of 10 million. So you go from that one in um, 10 to the 15 that I was talking about up to um, you know, 10 million, so that's 10 to the 7, so you go from 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 8, 1 in 10 to the 8 or so. So you have this huge increase in concentration, and that's where the toxic effects of the mercury come in. And that's what we're concerned about. Um, so returning to um, thinking about mercury in the local environment, as Anna mentioned earlier on in the talk, we're, the two of us, together with another professor in the biology department, Ethan Klotfelter, um, have been interested in studying mercury in the local environment for the past couple of years. And the reason for that is because we're very close to the Mount Tom power plants in Hadley. We're certainly within, we're within 10 kilometer, kilometers of it. So we're certainly within the 150 kilometer range in which most of the reactive um, and particulate mercury is deposited from power plants. So we're primarily interested in the local effects of that mercury. <coughs> um, you can see, so this is a table of emissions um, from the Mount Tom power plant uh, and, the other, and the other coal-fired power plants in Massachusetts. So you can see Mount Tom here. It emits about 48 pounds of mercury per year, which is actually a, a huge amount. Okay? So remember what we were talking about, about concentrations. It doesn't take very much mercury to be toxic. Um, so Mount Tom is emitting about 48 pounds of mercury per year. Of that, we can look at the speciation of the mercury, because what we want to know is how much of that is going to be deposited locally. And we can get that from looking at the breakdown between elemental and reactive gaseous and particulate mercury. And you can see from these coal-fired electric utilities in the Northeast that there's actually a pretty large percentage, about 70%, um, that's emitted in forms that are deposited locally. Now, um, as part of the Clean Air Act and its successors, and actually the state of Massachusetts has been pretty proactive about mercury, um, there are now rules in the state of Massachusetts about um, reduction of mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants. And these are those rules that by January 1st, 2008, um, and this 86 pounds is the total for the state of Massachusetts, and it represents um, an 85% capture of the, the mercury um, in the original coal. So that's phase one, which was supposed to have been completed by January 1st, and then by October 1st, 2012, it's supposed to have been decreased by 95%, okay, by implementing new technologies at these coal-fired power plants. However, um, in 2007, um, the Mount Tom station announced that it will not meet the new requirement, that is the phase one requirement, until September of 2009. So they're already behind on that. And in the meantime, they continue to emit at the level of today. Okay. 
So what we're doing, um, one of the, the aspects of our project, is actually to measure mercury in the atmosphere and mercury deposition in the local environment, as we said. Um, the place that we're actually doing this um, is at the bunker, um, the, the Amherst College Book Depository, which is up on the notch, um, heading towards South Hadley. Um, and uh, this figure here, I'm going to finish up real quick because I realize people have to leave, um, is actually a projection of where we expect to see that deposition. So this is a simulation or a prediction of where we um, expect to see the mercury deposition from the Mount Tom power plant. And we're actually in the process of collecting wet deposition samples to measure um, this mercury deposition and the mercury concentration. So in a few years, hopefully, we'll be able to report back to you on that and let you know how much uh, mercury we're actually seeing from the Mount Tom power plant. And as I said, this is a collaborative process. I'm focusing on the atmospheric part of the process. But then once it gets into the hydrological systems, Professor Martini and her students have been working on that part. So I'll let her talk to you about that. I'll just do this in one line. This is a sediment core from the Oxbow Lake that's in the shadow of Mount Tom. These are PPM levels, parts per billion levels of mercury. We have some levels that are up or near to 350 uh, parts per billion, and that's a lot of mercury in those sediments. So it's no surprise that we have a, a ton of mercury, literally, uh, in our local environment. And that's what we're looking at. And if you look historically, it goes down to very low levels. Well, Mount Tom Power Plant hasn't been around that long. So you can see in the lake cores exactly when it was built and when it got lit and when it started to uh, put mercury into the environment. And with that, uh, I think we'll let you guys go. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to receive them. Thanks. Thank you very much.